Today I'm going to talk to us about heart development and what can go wrong with the heart. I can't cover every single different congenital uh, heart defect, but I will go through just a couple of them. And then if you have any individual questions, then there'll be time sort of at coffee or lunchtime where we can talk about anything if anyone has any questions at that point. Okay, so talking about the very beginning and how the heart develops. So at week three of pregnancy, so before people, most people even know that they're pregnant, is at this stage that we have a ball of cells, and this is known as a blastocyte. And this contains DNA from both the mother and the father. By week four, this is the stage where the ball of cells is officially known as an embryo. And an embryo is something that we, we call the sort of the fetus or the, the baby as it's growing until it becomes a proper baby in the womb. So at week four, this tiny, tiny little embryo is only the size of a poppy seed, so it's really, really minute. And by week five, we now actually have a heartbeat. So if you think about it, most people still don't even know they're pregnant at week five, but the embryo has a heart and it's beating. And that heartbeat beats about twice the speed of a normal adult heartbeat. And by this point, the baby's still only the size of a sesame seed. So it's still really, really small, but we actually have a heartbeat as early on as five weeks. So the heart develops from these specialist cells, and they turn into this very primitive tube. And then this tube, it expands in different areas, and it sort of does this process known as looping, where it sort of bends around, and then eventually gives us the actual structure of the heart. So in this slide, we can just see some of the process of the looping. So the first, this bit over, over here, this shows us the tube and just some of the little bulges that are happening. And then the next phase is the looping. So as that tube sort of bends around, and you can see at this point, we start to have a very early sort of atrium, so the top chamber of the heart, and the ventricles. But they're still just bulges in a tube. Eventually, we, these bulges will form the proper heart with all the electrical activity. Now, this is a very busy picture, and really it's there just to show us that all of these things have to happen, and they all have to happen correctly in order for the heart to develop correctly. So there's lots of signaling between the cells, so essentially talking between the cells, and there's lots of different things that are going on from the actual cell sending out information in order for them to reproduce and give us the normal heart. So you can see that there's a lot that can go wrong. So as we know, congenital heart disease makes up just less than 1%, so 0.8% of all babies born in the UK will have something wrong with their heart. As we see from that slide that happened just before this one, there's so many different things that can actually affect what goes wrong with the heart and what different type of condition you can have. Some of these conditions will be very complex and need surgery very soon after birth. For other conditions, it may be that a person gets into adulthood before we even know that there's something actually wrong with the heart but they will have still been born with it. So we still don't fully understand exactly all the different things that cause congenital heart disease. Some things we do know will have an effect, so there can be something wrong with an individual gene, and something like Down syndrome is caused by a problem with one chromosome. But we know that if the mother, for instance, has diabetes and isn't well controlled, then that can go on to affect the heart. Also, maternal infections like rubella it causes many different problems, but particularly causes problems for the heart. We know that drug abuse, 
that can cause problems to the heart. And also some environmental issues like radiation. So, you know, going back to what I was saying earlier on, where all of these things are developing very early on, sort of week three, week four, week five. So most people don't even know they're pregnant. But if you have something like a chest X-ray during that time, that can affect the heart of your, your baby or fetus at the time. So we're striving to get to this normal heart. And in the normal heart, we have four chambers. So we have this right atrium, left atrium, right ventricle, and left ventricle. Now, these top chambers, the atriums, they collect the blood. So the blood coming back into the heart from either the lungs or from the body will come into either the right or left atrium. And then they'll go through some valves, and the valves just act like doors. So they open to let the blood flow in, and then they close when we don't want blood to move the wrong way. And these ventricles at the bottom of the heart, they're our big pumps. That's what pumps the blood out to either the body or the lungs. Now, when the baby is first born, there are extra little bits in the heart. So when the baby is growing in, in the mum's tummy, in the womb, then the baby's not breathing. So the lungs are full of fluid. So the same fluid that's in the sac that surrounds the baby, the baby swallows all of that fluid and it sits in the lungs. So we're not using the lungs to breathe and to get oxygen. So we have these little holes. So there's a hole between the two collecting chambers, the atria, and we also have a little tube between the two main arteries. And that's just so that the blood can go away from the lungs and actually help the baby develop and get much more blood to the cells so that everything can develop because we don't need as much blood going to the lungs because we're not using the lungs at this point. But as soon as the baby is born and takes its first breath, these things start to change. The fluid starts coming out of the lungs and the lungs fill up with air. And then this tube between the two main arteries, that starts to close. And the little hole between the two atria should also close at this point. Sometimes these things don't happen. And this is, the, both of these conditions are known as parts of congenital heart disease. So sometimes the tube between the two main arteries doesn't close, but we can deal with that quite simply. One of the things we can do is we can take the baby to the catheter lab and insert a tube into the artery and put essentially a plug into that tube to plug it off so that it's not open anymore. And these pictures here are pictures from the cath lab. And you can see here the tube is still open, so you can see that the blood can move from the art between the arteries. And this is one when it's been plugged off and the blood can no longer go between the two arteries. This is the only condition that we truly say is absolutely fixed and, and will never ever cause us any trouble again if we can close this when the patient is very young. The other thing that we have, as I say, is this hole between the two atria. Now, it's not a true hole. It's not a complete gap. It's like a little door, so it's a flap. And if it doesn't close, the door stays open, so blood can move between the two atria. And you can see in this picture here that there's just a little hole through here, but you can see the flap of the septum here. Now, many people still have this hole open. And we think probably about a third of all people will have this flap still open. But because it's a door, it's not really a big problem. So I know, for instance, that I have this flap still open, and I'm perfectly fit and healthy, and I don't need any intervention. It doesn't cause 
any problems to us at all. The only time that it might cause problems is if you get clots. So if you suffer from arrhythmias and things, then sometimes those clots can move between there and cause stroke. But it's a, a very difficult one to decide whether to actually go and close these because we can cause more problems by closing them than actually leaving them open and having perfectly fit, healthy adults. But as I say, that, that little hole that's there from birth is very different to a true septal defect, which is something like an ASD, which is an atrial septal defect. That's a true hole. And here's a picture just showing the difference. So we no longer just have a small hole with a flap. This is an actual gap in the septum. So these are different. And these types of holes we do need to go on and close. So I'll just talk around a couple of uh, little um, things that can go wrong with the heart. So we, I mentioned that there are various different valves in the heart. So we have valves between the top chambers and the bottom chambers, so the atria and the ventricles, but we also have valves coming out of the main arteries. So the pulmonary artery, that has a valve, and so does the aorta. And those valves should look like this. And they have three leaflets. And if we look at them straight on, they look a little bit like a Mercedes car sign. So a circle with the sort of the three lines down them. I'm sure you all know what Mercedes car signs look like. We can have this bicuspid valve. Now that means bicuspid, meaning two leaflets. And that looks more like this. So instead of having the three lines and the three leaflets, you just have two leaflets. Now this tends to not cause any problems in the sort of in the young baby or even in the child. But it is something that we do need to follow up quite closely because we know with some people this causes problems later on. And what we know with the bicuspid valve is that actually the whole cell around the aorta, all of those cells that make up the aorta are not completely normal. We don't know why, but we know that they're not completely normal. So with the bicuspid valve, sometimes the aorta starts to get a little bit too big, and then that stretches the valve, and then that means that the valve starts to leak. So we don't only have the problem with the leaky valve, but we also have a problem with the large aorta. So that's something that even though people are, are very, very well, and it's quite difficult for us when we're dealing with, with the pediatric population, our children, because they are perfectly well, and it's difficult to tell them that actually we need to follow you up right the way through your 80s and your 90s, and because they feel fine. But we have to give them the information to tell them that we know that there's a potential that something might go wrong further down the line. So how can we tell when there's something wrong with the heart? We have lots of different uh, tests that we can do, and they all give us slightly different information. So we have chest x-rays, and I'm pretty sure everybody in this room will have had a chest x-ray at some point during their time, certainly in this hospital. Echoes, when we come along and we stick the cold jelly on your chest and prod and poke with our with our sort of uh, different transducers and things. Uh, then we have MRIs. Now, MRI we don't use quite as often, but we're starting to use more and more. It's something we don't use quite so much in, again, our children, uh, but we use much more now in the adult department. And then how we write the, about the heart as well. We have our own sort of language in a way, just like lawyers do. We like to put things into a language that pretty much only we can understand, but it's there for a purpose. And we use a way of documenting exactly where everything is in the heart using this special language. And really what we're doing is we're stating exactly where the atria are, so exactly where the top chambers are, then we talk about how the atria 
connect to the ventricles, and then the ventricles to the main arteries. And that's so that when we see any of our tests, like our echoes and our MRIs, we can almost visualize what your heart looks like. So it's a very specific way that we do that. So an X-ray takes a couple of seconds to perform, and people often think what we're doing a chest X-ray for is to look at the lungs. But in actual fact, it gives us huge amounts of information about the heart. This is a normal chest X-ray. And in this chest X-ray, we can see the lungs. These are the lungs. This blobby thing here, this is the heart. And then we have sort of diaphragms and things. We have lots and lots of information on chest X-rays. In particular, we can look. These are the ribs, these sort of whited sort of lines. And we can see in this that those ribs are nicely spaced apart. And that's good. And also, we can measure the size of the heart. So what we do is we just measure from one side to the other side, and then we measure the whole of the chest. And the heart should be less than half of the whole size of the chest. Now, everyone's heart, normal heart, should be about the size of your fist. So if you're a very small person, your heart will be smaller. If you're a very tall, big person, then your heart will be the size it should be to pump everything around your body. So everybody's heart is individual in size. So things like being able to measure it on a chest X-ray, as easy as that seems, actually gives us a huge amount of information. Because we know the bigger the heart is, then it's not going to work quite so well. It's being stretched. So here's a chest X-ray that's not so normal. And you can see there's lots of differences with this one from the one that we just looked at. So Straight away, we can see with these ribs, these ribs are really close together. Now, that shows us that the patient has previously had an operation on the side between the ribs. And when we do an operation on the side, we cut into the muscle, and then that muscle sort of shrinks down, and so the ribs get closer together. So even without having the medical notes and things, we can straight away see that this patient has had an operation through the side. So that helps us to sort of think, right, we know there's only a couple of operations that we do through the side, so we can start to piece together what's wrong with this heart. We can also see that this heart is much bigger than the heart we saw previously. So again, we can measure from one side to the other side, and then measure against the whole side of the chest. And we can see that this heart is big. We can also see that these little circular things that are running down here means the patient's previously had an operation through the front as well, because these are the little wires that the surgeons use to put the chest all back together again. We can also see this is a pacemaker, and these are the wires going into the heart. So we get masses of information from a chest X-ray. We do look at the lungs, but we're specifically looking at the heart as well as the lungs. So we can get lots and lots and lots of information from something that takes just a couple of seconds to perform. So I'm just going to mention just a couple of, uh, of heart conditions, and I've sort of just chosen a few that we see most frequently in our centre. That doesn't mean to say that they are the most common conditions, but they're the most common ones to us in the centre. So one of the conditions that we see is tritalogy of fallow, and that's made up of four different things that have gone wrong with the heart. So first of all, we can see here where number one is, there's a hole between the two ventricles. So that's known as a ventricular septal defect. Then this is our pulmonary artery, which carries the blood to the lungs. And we can see here, just beneath it, there's some thick muscle. That should be nice and thin and smooth, but that thick muscle 
grows a bit too big, and sometimes in, in the very small babies, it can even go into spasm, and it sort of really sort of fights against itself and causes a difficulty for the blood to get to the lungs. So these babies, when they're very small, can have what we call spelling, where that muscle just closes off the way for the blood to get out to the lungs, and the babies become very blue and quite unwell. We also know that the pulmonary artery valve isn't normal in these patients as well. And because it's difficult for the blood to get out to the lungs, the right ventricle, which does the pumping of the blood to the lungs, the muscle of that becomes quite thick because it has to work harder. So the heart is just like any other muscle in your body. If you make it work hard, that muscle will grow. Okay? We can reverse it by doing surgery and things, but it concerns us if the muscle gets too thick or if the heart gets too big. And the other thing that happens in Tritalogy of Fallow is that the aorta, because there's a hole between the two ventricles, there's nothing to keep the aorta into the left side, so it moves slightly into the right side. So you will hear us talk about things like shunting, and what we're talking about there is the way the blood is moving through any holes that you might have in the heart. So here is a picture where we have a hole between the two ventricles. So just like we saw in the fallow, number one was the ventricular septal defect, and it's this hole between the two ventricles. What we look at with this is which way the blood is going through that hole, because that can tell us where the pressure is highest in the heart. So we know that in the normal heart, the left side of the heart has the highest pressure, because that has to pump all the way around the body. So it sends the blood everywhere. And that's quite hard work. And blood's lazy. It wants to do as little as possible. So if there's a hole, it's going to take the easy option. So if the pressure's higher on the left side and lower on the right side, then the blood's going to slip through the hole and go to the lower pressure because it's nice and easy over there. But if the blood goes from the right side to the left side, that tells us the pressure's highest on the right side. So say it's, just, it's all to do with the blood being very lazy. So there's lots of different things that we can do that aren't complete repairs of the heart. And I'm not sure exactly what's wrong with each individual person, but sometimes, and usually when you're quite little, if we need to get blood to a place that it isn't easily getting to, so if you have difficulty in narrowing getting the blood out into the lungs, we have to somehow help that blood get to the lungs. Sometimes, as babies, you can be too small to have what we call a, a big operation to sort of correct the flows properly. So sometimes we do things like we add tubes in just so that we can get the blood where we want it to be and grow you so that we can have you big enough to do the bigger operations. And one of those things that we do is this thing called the BT shunt. And that's a tube between the aorta and the pulmonary artery. So if you have a blockage so that the blood can't get to the lungs, then we'll pop one of these tubes in and we'll send it there after the blockage. And then that will help that the heart doesn't have to work quite so hard to get the blood to the lungs. And we can grow you and we can wait a few months until we can do the, the bigger operation. So really, all cardiac surgery is plumbing. So anyone who's looked at any plumbing in your house, 
It's all pipes and pumps, and that's all we're doing is making sure there's no blockages of the blood getting, or just like you'd have at home. You, know, you don't want hair down your plugs because then that's not going to get the water draining out. And it's just the same for the heart and all your arteries and veins. It's just making sure that it flows beautifully and you keep your pump working. The difference with, with cardiac surgery compared to plumbing is we can't just nip down B&Q and buy another pump or some more pipes. So we have to do that through making sure that we look after these things. So another condition that we see quite a lot of is this one called transposition of the great arteries. Now, in this case, we have the aorta and the pulmonary artery have developed the wrong way round. So instead of the aorta coming out of the left ventricle and the left ventricle doing all the hard work and pumping all the blood around the body, in this case, we've got the aorta coming out of the right side and the pulmonary artery coming out of the left side. You might sort of think, well, that doesn't really matter. But the problem is, is what you end up with is the blood coming out of the left side and going off to the lungs. It nicely goes around the lungs, picks up lots of oxygen, but then comes back into the same side of the heart. So we have two separate circuits. So there's no way for oxygen to get around the body. So it makes it very difficult, impossible even, for that baby to develop. So we have to do things quite quickly to these babies. And in fact, we'd like to, do, in this case, do a big operation within the first four to six weeks of life. So tiny, tiny little babies that we need to do these operations on. And we have two operations that we can do for these sorts of patients. This one, the mustard or the senin operation, is one we did for many, many years, and as actually sort of one we still do sometimes, but we have a, another operation that we sort of prefer these days. But we have lots and lots of patients with the mustard operation because the other operation didn't really come into being until the 80s. So we have lots of people with this type of operation. And just as I said before about it all being plumbing, we have to find a way of making sure the blood gets to the lungs and the body, and then from the body and back to the lungs. So we have to do this thing called baffling, and we just add little extra pipes in, and we put that through the top chambers of the heart, through the atria, and we put that extra sort of plumbing through to drop it into the left side of the heart. So we move it from the right side of the heart through this extra tube into the left side of the heart. And then we create a hole to make the left side of the blood move into the right side of the heart. So we're just redirecting things. <coughs> and this is the newer operation that we have for people who were born with transposition of the great arteries. But we can only do this operation within the first four to six weeks. So maybe in things like developing countries where this operation is very difficult to come by, or sometimes people may not realize that they have these conditions if there are holes and tubes still open from birth. So if you're older than six weeks, you'll still have the previous operation. But we do have this newer one where we actually just cut off both of the arteries and swap them over. So I say, just like you would do if your hot tap wasn't flowing properly and your cold tap and they were going the wrong way, you just swap the pipes over. And that's exactly what we do. So it's slightly more technical, but essentially that's, that's what we're doing. Nobody tell a surgeon I called them a plumber, by the way. <laughs> so I said earlier on when we were talking about the fallows, if there's any problems with blockages anywhere, then we have to add in extra tubes. So this condition, sort of pulmonary atresia, means that your pulmonary valve hasn't formed properly and is blocked. So then you can't get blood out to the lungs. There's nowhere for it to go. So we have to add in tubes 
to help get blood to the lungs. So we might start, when babies are very small, to do that with one of those little shunts. And then usually what we'll do is we'll then move on to something a bit bigger and we'll sort of create yourself a new sort of pulmonary section of pulmonary artery by putting in a nice big tube that we call a conduit, but essentially it's just an extra bit of piping. This word atresia just means absent. So pulmonary atresia, absent valve, it's not there, it's blocked. Tricuspid atresia, again, it's another valve that's absent and blocked. So again, with this one, this time we have a difficulty with the blood getting from the right atria to the right ventricle. So we have to find ways around dealing with that. So it's again about just redirecting the blood so that we can get it everywhere that we need it to go. And this is a different type of thing that we can use, which is actually using your own body rather than adding pipes in. And what we can do with this is we can disconnect some of your pipes and add them to other pipes so that we can have flow going around, missing out the bits that are blocked. And in this case, we use one of the vessels that brings the blood from the head and we put it straight onto the lungs. And this one is called a glen. Okay? And that's just, let's say, just redirecting the blood again using your own vessels. And then eventually we have probably our most complex bit of plumbing. And in this plumbing, we're actually only now using the heart as one bit of pumping rather than two. So we talked about there being a right ventricle and a left ventricle. So normally we'd have those two as pumps. But if we go down this type of plumbing, then we only end up with one pump and we've bypassed the blood from the other pump using your own vessels, so the head vessels, and the ones coming back to the heart from the lower body, so your legs and your liver and everything. And we connect that through a tube and go send it straight to the lungs. So we're not using now the heart to pump to the lungs. So the main issue with this is we need to make sure that the blood flows really nicely because that one pump is having to do all of the work. So, say, just like we were talking about with, with our plumbing at home, we must make sure in this situation there's no blockages in the system at all and everything's flowing very nicely. So sometimes we use uh, different tablets to make the blood a little bit thinner so that it makes it make sure it's flowing through those pipes nice and easily. And we can do these by going through the heart. So we can either go inside the heart or we can go outside of the heart, which is this tube here just running outside of the heart. The two things do the same thing, but we tend to use the one going outside of the heart a little bit more now. But many, many people have the one going through the heart. So, so everything that we do is really just about making sure that that blood flows very nicely and we look after the pump. So things that we can do ourselves, and it's true for everybody, whether you've got a heart condition or not, is looking after the pump, because that's the number one thing we don't want to damage. So things like healthy eating, doing a bit of exercise, uh, not smoking, not drinking excessive amounts of alcohol, all of those things will help to protect that muscle. And you know, when you all come to clinic, we do blood pressures and things. We're not just looking at your blood pressure just for fun. We're looking at your blood pressure to see how high it is. Are there any blockages in the system anywhere? But also we know that if you have high blood pressure, that will also affect the pumping of the heart. We don't want it to have to pump hard because we want it to last till you're very old. So we have to look after that as much as we can. So it's a bit of a two-way thing. We can, do, we can do the plumbing side of it and look after the blood flow and the tubes and things, but you guys have to look after the pump as well. And that's it from me. Does anyone have any questions? about?